Hi everyone, thank you. Um, so I hope most of you have heard uh, at the term artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence. Um, the sort of textbook definition would be um, sort of the study of building um, an agent, as we call them, uh, to solve a variety, a large variety of very complex tasks before, b without needing to be reprogrammed. So this uh, is a very long uh, quest which uh, we have taken on and there's still a long way to go for us to sort of see it done. But crucially, it's already shown a lot of advancements and a lot of uh, progress that we already see in our day to day. Uh, but this talk, I actually want to explain how we, the researchers, are actually trying to achieve this goal. So not only like define it, but actually how are we tackling nowadays um, building AGI. So imagine for a second that I ask you to be sort of a bit of an engineer perhaps and do something that to us looks extremely trivial. We do this every day. So there's a robot and I ask you, okay, you build an algorithm, a sequence of instructions to make this robot open a door. Now, it is very common to sort of break out this problem into several pieces and what you could do is sort of say, do that, right? So, well, to open the door, I'll find the door, find where the handle of the door is, grab it, push it down, and open it. And it turns out, uh, out that if you actually, strictly speaking, do this sort of rule-based, um, uh, hierarchical way to solve a complex problem, breaking it down into smaller, not so complex problems, you end up with something that um, perhaps is not so optimal. So, so if you simply try to program what's going to happen is the door is already open, you are not accounting for this, um, the terrain is not as you know, nice as you would have hoped, and the key concept here is that your algorithm will not generalize to the complexity of the world. This, by the way, is from the DARPA competition in 2015, so these programs are not really as simple as the four lines I showed you. Um, and it really shows that trying to build algorithms through this like, rule-based um, chain of rules um, sort of approach really sort of is bound to failure in most cases. Although, of course, these were like the funny ones. Um, so let's try to go to the next line. Yeah. So here is how you could do this, perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, I call this the learning approach, and this is it's studied a lot nowadays. So take the problem of finding the door, right? How would you program that, right? So if, if you, you, you were, may, maybe you have these pixels, you try to find these rectangular objects that look like doors perhaps, and as you, you saw, there, it's not gonna generalize to any conditions you may have not imagined, and then you have to try and error, iterate, and this really doesn't scale because you're just now opening doors and how about doing anything else? So the paradigm here is I'm going to instead try to get a lot of pictures of doors um, and I have human labelers labeling where the doors are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn what a lot door looks like instead of programming in terms of rules. And this is very, very important. So unfortunately, in computer vision, People care about other objects, not doors, and people generally don't take pictures of, of doors. So I'm going to show you the example of finding actually cats and dogs, which are very popular objects um, in the research community. So <laughs> how are we actually going to do that? So the first step to finding the cat, whether an image contains, let's say, a cat or a dog, is to build a big database of pictures that contain either cats or dogs and then literally ask humans to label thousands or tens of thousands of examples um, of images like this one, which actually is a dog, although this one is pretty tricky, I, I would say. So how would you even you know, code this and go through the pixels and so on? So the first piece is get this database of labeled examples. Once you have this, the second step is allow for a generic program to be able to learn the characteristics or the patterns on this database. And that's precisely what deep learning and in particular deep neural nets um, are enabling us to do. 
So here you see a deep neural network that actually processes the image, the raw pixels, and activates certain neurons in this architecture that could well be, for instance, um, de detecting the size of the animal, the fluoriness, whether it has picky ears, and so on. And crucially, these features that this neural network is activating on this image are not pre-programmed by us. These are fully learned from this database. So again, we have the database. We have this model that is powerful enough to represent all sorts of interesting features that eventually lead to an output that is the probability that the image contains a cat or a dog. And what you essentially do is feed one image at a time to this network of, of the training database and ask it to predict the correct label all the time. Eventually, all these sort of connections settle onto a configuration that works well and generalizes beyond the images that it's been trained on. And it generalizes so well that, in fact, billions of pictures every single day are being analyzed through this kind of algorithm. So the next and one of the sort of breakthroughs in 2014, which uh, me and collaborators and other groups um, sort of discovered, is not only this idea of taking an image and producing a probability, but also taking a sort of sequence of symbols and mapping it through learning examples to another sequence of symbols. And this is a very powerful concept because now we can also learn, for instance, to do machine translation. So here, the sequence, the input sequence would be the Chinese characters and the output would be English words. And crucially, you learn this without any knowledge about language or which words correspond to which words. All you need is a large database of pairs of sentences in Chinese and in English, translations of each other. And from a few of these pairs of examples, you essentially achieve a system that actually generalizes and improves upon the, the previous state of the art. So in fact, uh, Google Translate has been upgraded recently to use these sort of neural networks approaches that essentially bridge the gap between the previous best systems and human quality translations um, by 50% by essentially. So this again is already used and it's sort of already out there for everyone to benefit from. Another such example that is sort of interesting is generating speech. So we actually do understand how speech is generated, right? There's a vocal track, which essentially is a bunch of tubes that ch change in shape. And you could actually m model this, and this is one of these parametric approaches that you see there on the left. But you can also do is just record these acoustic the audio files, essentially, from many people, uh, which will look very complex from afar. There's like tens of thousands of points per second of speech. But again, you just let a neural network figure out the sort of patterns in this signal. And what you get end up with is a very good natural sounding speech system that again bridges the gap between the previous best and human speech by about a 50% factor. So this is some like drastic already sort of um, well-developed ideas that supervised learning enabled us to do. And it's all about this idea of imitation learning. You imitate humans through these powerful models, deep neural nets. So now there is another paradigm I wanted to describe, which is what if we cannot get a large database of these examples? Or even better, we want to actually go beyond human capabilities, right? If we actually want to beat humans, um, if we imitate them, we are kind of bounded by how good they are. And this is the reinforcement learning paradigm. Um, and for instance, in the game of Go, this was heavily used to, to, for the recent result that AlphaGo achieved uh, last year. So, it is extremely simple how this works. It's almost like obvious. The first step is we have an agent, which is in this case the Go player, and this agent lives in an environment. So the environment would be the Go board, or in the robot case, the world. Um, and this agent has a goal. For instance, it wants to win at the game of Go. And the way this works is quite simple. The agent observes the environment, um, so it observes, let's say, the go board or the door or what, what not, 
and it can also act upon the environment. It can, for instance, play a piece of the board. That would be one action, right? I play in position 4, 5, for instance, in, the, in that um, sort of game. And eventually, cycling to this, um, the game finishes, and the environment tells the agent whether it won the game or not. And after it's been told whether it won or not, it updates its weights to ensure that essentially the, the reward that it gets, the probability of winning, is maximized. So this agent is very, very similar to the neural network that was classifying cats or dogs. But in this case, it takes as the inputs these observations, so it would be a go board or maybe a video game screen or, 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 and whatnot, and the outputs are simply the probability of each action, so which joystick position you want to play. And through this process, you can achieve superhuman performance in playing a tie, go, and so on. So very crucially, it is most of these algorithms have been developed, uh, developed on games, um, which is kind of funny because as a kid I used to play video games, and now I sort of work on making algorithms play video games I don't get to play. But despite these profound you know, re realizations, um, what you actually uh, get to do when you do through these through video games is being able to scale. Because as you can imagine, this circle of observations and actions, initially it's not very good. So in, in other words, if you act randomly, you're not going to get rewards very often. So you have to play a lot in order to achieve good performance. But if you go out to the real world, things will be very slow. If, if you were to build 10,000 robots that you would crash and eventually you learn how to do this, that wouldn't scale very well. So video games are very important because you can run them in parallel in a cluster and if you lose, it's not a big deal. Um, but eventually, you are testing sort of ideas about intelligence through these video games which, which were designed by making essentially humans um, you know, imagine and plan and so on. Uh, so this is our sort of research platform. It has been so far until um, recently and it's, it's going to be in the future as well. But what's the problem? Well, the environment, if the environment is very simple, we will learn very simple agents. So the environment and the agents go side by side. And as you can imagine, the real world is extremely complex. So there are like, you know, predators out there that might want to eat you. You need energy, so you might want to eat plants or other, other uh, human, uh, be not human beings, beings. Um, and, and it's very diverse and very complex, right? So it seems like creating environments and creating agents goes, go hand by hand. And it indeed does. So one of the, the, the ideas here is if we are simulating the, the natural world, and we want, for instance, to get this guy to like, survive the winter, we will need to simulate snow and food and so on. And that is a hard problem by itself as well. However, um, you know, what we can actually try to do is, well, we researchers not only build agents, but we are actually also think about environments that will make agents advance. And amongst many new um, you know, environments that people create, last year we created this environment, which um, is called DeepMind Lab which looks like three-dimensional. Um, you know, researchers can set all sorts of tasks to test, to test ideas about planning, memory, imagination, and so on. And I'll show you just a simple example where an agent will essentially go around and try to eat apples but do not eat lemons. Um, this is another video where there's actually like more naturalistic looking video and there's an agent out there that is sort of navigating this complex world um, figuring out that apples might appear again because they grow and so on and so forth. So these environments are becoming more pro pro complex and as a result our agents will also of course learn better there. Um, now as sort of a final note, um, it is kind of obvious that we need AI. It's, it's, it's very helpful to you know, be able to have translation systems, um, you might have a personal assistant in your phone, like helping you organize trips and so on and so forth. But it also seems apparent that um, AI needs nature. We need to encode these complex rules for AI to be useful to us. Otherwise, um, we are just bound by the complexity of the environment in which agents live in. Um, and so, with that note, um, I, I'd like to just thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to chat with you outside. Thanks. <laughs>